Is serverless cloud computing fading away? Some people think so. Let's talk about it. Welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider podcast and YouTube channel, where we talk about the truth of cloud computing and the realities around generative AI. I'm your host, David Linthicum, author, speaker, b geek, and here to guide you through the realities of cloud computing and how to make it work for your enterprise. Well, this is a topic I've been kicking around uh, for a couple of years now. Um, and, and by the way, I, I've, I've done some work in serverless computing. I have a course out on LinkedIn Learning on serverless computing and have written and spoken about it lots of times. And uh, really just coming around to the realities of how people are leveraging this technology and how architects should consider serverless cloud computing in kind of the mix of architectural tools that they have at their disposal to solve problems. And this also came about with this uh, InfoWorld article I just wrote. I'll put the link in the description, but uh, you can see it up there, where we talked about some of the benefits and also some of the deficits around leveraging serverless computing. First, let's talk about what serverless computing is, because not everybody knows about it. So it's an execution model in which cloud providers provide dynamic uh, management for the allocation and provisioning of server resources. So in traditional cloud computing, we had to allocate the resources that we needed for our application solutions. In other words, storage, compute, uh, databases, things like that. And you had to kind of, I wouldn't say guess, but size those resources so you're leveraging enough resources to keep your application running and to support the performance that you're looking for in terms of memory size, things like that. But not over-provision where you're overpaying for the technology service on the cloud-based system. So in comes serverless computing, which by the way, does not mean you don't use servers, it just use in a different way, where it's able to allocate those resources dynamically for you on your behalf. And so we don't have to think about provisioning resources as much anymore. We go ahead and run our applications and normally run them within functions. And they're able to expand to the amount of processing power and storage power and memory that you need to support that particular application execution. And when it's done executing, it puts everything back. And this is by no, no, no means new. We've had platform as a service providers who were doing this for years, but the traditional infrastructure as a service providers, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, uh, didn't have the ability to do that. So many, many years ago, this is not new, by the way, adopted the paradigm of serverless computing. So using this technology, developers can run code in response to events without managing the infrastructure. Uh, again, we don't have to think about the infrastructure. We just run the code. We focus on the application logic, and it carries it out on our behalf, which is, which is great. Because if we don't have to think about the back-end resources, we're not likely to make mistakes like over-provisioning and under-provisioning resources. And the price is going to be based on the amount of resources that you use. And so at the end of a, at the end of a serverless function execution, you're going to get the amount of processing resources and storage resources and memory resources that you use to execute that function. And it's going to give you a price for that, normally 10 cents, 15 cents, things like that. But of course, applications can do this thousands of times a day, which can run up a pretty good bill. So that's what we have to kind of keep an eye on when we leverage serverless computing. So what are the serverless computing offerings that are out there that are provided by the public cloud providers? Well, the big three uh, provide them. AWS Lambda uh, allows developers, which is their AWS's serverless computing offering, allows developers to run code in response to events, again, without provisioning or managing servers. Uh, they were kind of the first uh, to the game. Uh, again, many years ago, this is nothing new. Azure Functions, which is a uh, serverless computing infrastructure, allows you to run event-driven code, again, without managing infrastructures. And of course, Google has their answer to that, which is Google Cloud Functions, which allows code execution in response to events and supports stateless code running in environments. They all do this a little differently. Uh, you have to remember that if you're going to leverage a particular uh, cloud serverless platform, you're going to be beholden and you're kind of be locked into that platform. We'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So, but they do things differently. They have different uh, 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 capabilities and different interfaces and different APIs and how they're leveraged and different ways in which you program them. So they're unique unto themselves. And obviously um, they can't closely coordinate uh, how they uh, build their serverless solution. They're competing with each other. And so they're gonna take their own version of that. And that's how the market kind of built itself out. 
So let's talk about the pros or, or the benefits of cloud computing, serverless computing, uh, cloud-based serverless computing uh, uh, infrastructure resources, services. First would be speed of deployment, since I don't have to think about my infrastructure resources like uh, processor, processor size, memory size, com- uh, storage size, things like that. I can just go ahead and uh, run my application, and it's going to do that for me uh, automatically on the back end, which is awesome. So that's going to be uh, speed up development, since I don't have to think about that. It's removing a step. It's also removing something that I can make a mistake doing, again, over-provisioning, under-provisioning resources, and simplicity of it. So in other words, I'm not dealing with infrastructure that's going to be part of my development paradigm. So if I'm the developer, I'm focused on creating the best behavior for that particular application. Therefore, I'm focused on the functionality of that application, not necessarily on the uh, resources or infrastructure that are going to be supporting that application. So those are the pros. However, of course, and the reason we're making this video, there's there's a few cons that have popped up uh, over the years that uh, is uh, uh, really kind of moving enterprises away from serverless computing certainly isn't going to go away. It's going to become part of a larger ecosystem within the cloud providers. But as far as companies that are utilizing it to build applications, that seems to be diminishing right now, at least an interest in the technology. So here are some factors contributing to the reasons that server serverless computing is fading away. First and foremost, complexity of advanced use cases. While serverless is ideal for simple event-driven tasks, uh, it can uh, become complex for more advanced applications. So if we're doing a lot of event-driven things, or we're doing a lot of message processing things, we're doing things synchronously and asynchronously, uh, it doesn't necessarily support all those paradigms in the same way. So the more complex that the applications are, the more likely you're going to run into a, a wall within serverless computing. In fact, some of the application developers I've worked with over the years call it the serverless wall, where, in other words, they're they're so constrained by what the serverless systems do on a particular cloud provider that they run into a limitation that's going to limit their capability, limit their ability to do that. The other thing would be cold start latency. This is a performance issue, and the main drawbacks is the ability, uh, with the fact that the delay occurs when a serverless function is first invoked uh, after being idle. So in other words, when we invoke a function, there's going to be a little bit of a delay in the invocation of the function, the ability for that function getting up and running, and that can be problematic for applications that are requiring more real-time application responses. So if users are waiting for a screen to respond, things like that, it could be a problem. Cost efficiency at scale. Serverless may not always be the cost effective work for cost effective for every workload out there. Again, you have to understand that there's a trade-off in how serverless were will bill you for resources and how they leverage resources. In some cases, it's going to be advantageous. In other words, there's a reason to leverage serverless computing. In many other cases, it's going to cost more than a traditional cloud infrastructure or traditional cloud application. And so if there doesn't seem to be good control over that, people have a tendency to push back on serverless uh, computing and go to things like uh, reserve instances that might be more economical, or even uh, cheaper cloud providers that don't uh, offer serverless but are provide cheaper storage processing uh, power, things like that. And the next one, and also the probably the most important one, is vendor lock-in. Serverless platforms are often tightly coupled to specific cloud providers, and their APIs are unique to those cloud providers. I'm not going to use the word proprietary, but um, once you um, bind your application to those APIs and to those serverless systems, it's going to be difficult for you to move those applications to other cloud providers, to other serverless systems. And so... The fact of the matter is that most people don't move those applications, but they want to be able to move those applications. So the perception of and also the realities of vendor lock-in with some of the serverless systems out there cause many to move away from some of the serverless environments. And and by the way, that's the primary reason that I hear uh, from architects and users that are considering the utilization of serverless systems or not is they fear the lock-in of those systems. And it's it's a legitimate fear. You have to understand the trade-offs. And If we're building applications that are going to cost us multiple millions of dollars to build, we want to be able to take those applications from cloud to cloud, from platform to platform. And this obviously uh, has some latency in doing that. doesn't mean we can't do it. We can can certainly rewrite aspects of the system to use another serverless environment or even decouple it from a serverless environment and run it on a traditional cloud infrastructure. But there's a cost and there's a risk in doing that. 
So the next cons would be limited execution time and resources. Uh, they generally come with some restrictions on execution time. You can't run them in in perpetuity. <laughs> so yeah, there's so the cloud can providers are going to put limits on the resources, and therefore, if you have something like resource intensive or long running applications, they may not be suited for a serverless environment. Debugging and monitoring nitpicky stuff, but serverless environments can make it more challenging to debug and monitor applications compared to traditional server based models where developers have more control over the environment. And then finally, uh, well, not finally, security concerns. Security in serverless environments can be harder to manage as attack services is different and developers uh, need to adapt to the new paradigm. Also, I find that security professionals, people who are actually dealing with uh, serverless uh, computing resources that are security folks, um, don't know how to secure those environments. They struggle with it a bit because it is different than uh, the majority of the applications and the databases that are running in those environments. Then finally, event-driven programming model. The event-driven programming model, which is really systemic to what a serverless environment is, everything's function-based, can be unfamiliar to some developers and require a shift in mindsets. Um, I was familiar with it because I kind of uh, cut my teeth when I was a developer on leveraging function-based, event-driven uh, based systems because that's kind of the way you built things back then. Uh, but some developers aren't necessarily aligned with those models, and it does take some training to change the paradigms and change the thinking. So those are the cons. So why did this stuff evolve? Well, as I mentioned earlier, um, cloud providers thought it would be a good advantage for them in terms of market penetration to provide a serverless offering. And that's why things like Lambda were born and other clouds followed suit with their serverless offerings. So the, the initial promise was to offer simplis, uh, simplified infrastructure management and seamless scalabilities by allowing developers to run code, again, without managing the backend systems. But over time, the broad application of the term serverless led to a loss of precision. Suddenly, everything in the marketplace became serverless. And I do see this even in the AI area. So it's hard to tell what's really serverless and what's not because of dilution of really kind of the term of what serverless computing is. So if it doesn't have precision and therefore it's going to be confusing and therefore it's going to be less impactful because of that confusion. And also the strategic role and strategic nature of this technology, despite the hype, serverless technology has uh, always been seen as playing a strategic rather than a revolutionary role in cloud computing. It's more of a tactical thing uh, in terms of deploying applications that it is strategic to what the applications are and increasing the value. So it has a tactical value. Um, it has some pros and cons as we just went over. And it has to have a good business case or a reason why you use it. And what I'm finding is that as this technology evolves and the other development technology evolves, certainly the application of AI, and we're going to talk about that next, uh, serverless has uh, been seen to have a diminished value in terms of enterprise development and uh, the ability to build and deploy cloud computing applications. That's the reality of it. Of course, Enter generative AI. <laughs> so generative AI has specialized compute resources. Uh, and so AI-driven solutions require more data management and specialized compute capabilities. And this is areas where traditional serverless systems don't excel. So as people are building and deploying generative AI systems or AI systems, machine learning, and also generative AI, which is just an instance of machine learning, they're finding that the serverless uh, computing models is not as valuable as people thought it was. Shift in priorities. Um, as we prioritize AI and serverless models are often bypassed uh, in favor of more robust uh, AI optimized solutions. So serverless is not seen. Now they may, the cloud providers may reposition it as such, but are not seen as having a huge amount of value to AI development. So a lot of AI engineers who build applications and AI based developers, data scientists, things like that have a tendency to avoid some of the serverless stuff. And as you know, I teach the generative AI uh, architecture course that on Go Cloud Careers, and that becomes a area of discussion in terms of looking at the capabilities of this technology. In many of the problem domains that I see, it's going to be contraindicated. So that's going to be uh, a bit of a downside of leveraging serverless computing. So what does this all mean? Well, I think that serverless computing, as I mentioned at the beginning of the video, and also I mentioned in the article I wrote for InfoWorld, is going to start to fade away. It's not going to go away. Uh, nothing ever goes away. It just becomes a, a part of the ecosystem. You know, something that uh, was was valuable and had a huge amount of hype, you know, many years ago, but not so much today. 
So, but the core principles remain valuable, agility, cost efficiency, scalability, of course, cost efficiency, sometimes it depends and are uh, really kind of the selling points of serverless computing. And I think they're going to continue to influence some of the computing application design and deployment. So it's going to be there as a resource that developers are able to use. I just don't see many developers picking it as much as they did in the past as becoming kind of a strategic resource. It's going to become more tactical focused. Uh, and certainly we have serverless databases and serverless AI systems, which are basically using the same sort of paradigm with the ability to run applications without allocating the backend systems. We're going to see some of that growth as well. But again, it may cause more confusion in the marketplace than anything. So enterprises have to take an adaptive strategy. So the focus on alignment of their technology stack to the businesses, and that's really kind of the role of the architect. And we're looking at the best tools and technology to optimize the applications and the systems that we're building. And so that being the case, it's, it's going to be the yet depends things everybody hates, but serverless computing is going to be probably less effective in many of the applications, at least the ones that I'm seeing. As application development evolves, uh, paradigms evolve, thinking evolves. And also we have a tendency uh, within the world of technology to kind of move on after a while onto newer, uh, what we perceive as better things. And that may be a bad thing for serverless computing. So uh, it's gonna be there, but it is gonna start to fade if it hasn't faded away already um, because of everything I just mentioned in the video. Uh, not necessarily a bad thing. I had a good run. I mean, it started, uh, you know, many years ago. I remember writing and speaking about it, I think 10 years ago. Uh, and it just, uh, you know, and it, it's matured as a technology and it's going to fade away as a technology, just like many technologies have in the past. However, there are some companies that have built larger systems on serverless-based paradigms because they went all in on it uh, when they got into it. They're, the risk there is that this technology may go away on some cloud providers and not be supported. You have to consider the risk in doing that. I, I don't see the cloud providers pulling support for core capabilities of that, that technology. I just see not a lot of net new applications and ported applications that are going to be leveraging serverless computing. And that's what we're trying to say here. Well, that's all I got for this week. Uh, thank you, everybody, who's uh, liked and subscribed. And please do so now if you haven't uh, bothered to do that yet. We're getting up uh, well past 80,000 users, heading to 100,000 users, hopefully get there by uh, early fall time frame. I really su appreciate the support on everybody who supported the channel and all the kind words and the comments. And, you know, tell your friends, uh, people who are interested in cloud computing or looking for the reality and how to use this technology effectively. That's why we that's why I created this channel and that's why I created the podcast. And that's what we're all about. We're here to tell the truth, what works, what doesn't. Uh, and uh, no matter what anybody thinks about it. <laughs> so uh, anyway, have a great week. You guys be safe. I'll talk to you next week. Cheers. Bye.